anyway, uh, this is a tribute to Joe Palmer, who uh, passed away a year ago yesterday on April the 24th, 2020. Uh, 2020 took a lot from us, and that was just one more thing. Um, so we've got Pete Rollick here, Mike Griffin, the dude, a.k.a. Matthew Carpenter, uh, Jeff Thomas, Rick Lay, and Michael Sisko, and of course, the most important person in the room, Cat Pulver. So, hello everybody, thanks for being here. Um, I just want to do a really brief, have you guys introduce yourself, and then we're going to start with uh, Michael Sisko and talk about Joe and his work. And if you're watching live um, and you have a question, uh, please type it in there. We will we will do our very best to cover it. Can't promise, but we'll do our very best. So shout out any questions or comments that you want. So uh, Pete, introduce yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Pete Rollick. Uh, I write short stories and, and uh, novels, do a little bit of literary criticism. I sell books to John Langan and... Um, I, uh, I, co I collect a massive amount of Lovecraftian and Cthulhu Mythos material. What the hell? John Langan's here. Where? <laughs> hey, John. Hey, Mike. Uh, Mike Griffin, introduce yourself, please, sir. You are muted. I Great. thought you were yeah. like some computer whiz. I am, but mute on Zoom is pretty complicated. Uh, I am Mike Griffin, also known on my, my book covers as Michael Griffin. I'm a writer in the Portland, Oregon area. Thank you. Uh, let's see. John Langan. Uh, well, according to uh, Michael Sisko, I am a sketchy drifter who has just drifted into this uh, this convocation, <laughs> although I prefer Redneck Santa. I just um, saw that. But... Uh, yeah, hi, I'm John Langan. Um, I write some books, um, and uh, I'm very glad uh, to be able to be here for uh, for this today. Joe was uh, was really important um, to all of us, and I, I think you know to the field, however we define that. And I'm glad that we're we're taking this uh, this time to remember him. Well, um, Kat had asked me if we could do you know after the guest that I had lined up, which who was Bo Johnson really nice guy uh, if we could spend a little bit of time on Joe and I thought you know I'm just gonna ask Bo Johnson if he'll mind rescheduling he was very nice about it so he'll be the guest next week and so we can devote this entire episode to Joe and and John uh, I'm glad you're here I was I was hoping you'd make it so that wasn't what you wrote to me you were like stay away Lang and I don't want you here but okay fine if that's how we're gonna play this that's it was, yeah. it was reverse it was reverse day. I was trying reverse psychology on you, and it worked. I would have to have psychology to begin with for that to work. Uh, the dude, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Matt Carpenter. I run Easy Movie Night for Mike. Uh, so if you ever want to watch a horror movie, uh, just look at the Easy Facebook page. We have a show usually every Saturday night. I'm also giving out a prize this week. It is a novel in the Arkham Horror series by Fantasy Flight Games. This one itself is called The Last Ritual. Nice paperback. Uh, if you want to win it, send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put ritual in the subject heading. We usually draw a winner about a month or so after the fact, so plenty of time to get an entry in. Uh, thank you, Matt, for, for that and for running Easy Movie Night. And if you, if you forget what he just said about Easy Movie Night, all you have to do is go to uh, lovecrafteasing.com and one of the one of the choices at the top is exactly that Lovecraft Easing movie night and it'll point you in the right direction so um, anyway Jeff Thomas could you introduce yourself yeah Jeffrey Thomas uh, I'm a writer and live in Massachusetts New England uh, who we got left Rick Rick Lee writer and I'm a collector of pulp magazines uh, Cisco, I don't think I got to you yet, did I? No, uh, okay, Michael. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, please. Sorry, I'm, introduce uh, yourself. Cisco, I write and I teach. I live in New York City. I write uh, novels and short stories, and I also write literary criticism too. All right, and then 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I think who we have left is is Joe's wife, Cat Poor. Do you want to say something? We have Rick. Yep. Yeah, we got Rick. Yeah. Cat, you there? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. And All right. I'm the floor is yours. Oh, the luxury. Uh, Kat Pulver, wife of the late but not forgotten Joe Pulver, the pretty much only one in here who is not an artist or writer and owner of the only true German Godzilla. So Langdon, <laughs> forget it. We're done. Nine! Uh, yeah! <laughs> Nine! <laughs> the Godzilla is back. Uh, all right, so we've already had a question, and then we'll move on to Mike, Michael Cisco. Um, one question I have for the podcast I'm reading. Joe was very active on this podcast. Lots of programs. How did it start? You asked him to do it, and he just accepted. He really enjoyed it. Well, I guess this is more of a question for me. A long time ago, like nine years ago, the, the podcast wasn't really a podcast. It was just, I thought, you know, we get to see... I get to see these guys at conventions and so forth and not for like once a year, you know, or, or not very often at, at any rate. And I thought, you know, this would be the next best thing to just chat with everybody in person and help them to build this, you know, a small part of the weird fiction, cosmic horror community, uh, et cetera. Um, and then what happened was it, it, it kind of morphed, it evolved into a video podcast and uh, I wasn't asked I was told that Joe would be a part of it and I was just fine with that so if there is a if there's one single word if you only have one word to describe Joseph Pulver senior it would be passion in my opinion just a, a very very passionate guy in his work in his friendships in his support of other writers and editors and and creators so all right so i've answered that and let's hear from michael cisco for a bit hi thank you um so um like how long i can't even remember when did i meet joe it would have been michael michael i'm sorry can you speak up just a bit okay i'm sorry uh how is this, is this okay um, so I, I think I met Joe in the late 90s, um, sometime around, it would have been maybe 96 or 97, uh, <clears throat> when back when Bob Price was living in Bloomfield, New Jersey, and he would have these get-togethers at his house, and it would be, uh, you know, Joe was invited, and I think Joe was contributing to various of Bob's many zines, back when zines were zines, mm -hmm. <laughs> come to think of it, you know, when they were actually staple bound pieces of, of, of stationery that had to be mailed and eagerly awaited. And um, that was where, you know, and Joe always had something interesting to read. But when I met Joe, he really thought of himself as a fan. He identified himself as a fan, uh, as a Lovecraft fan, as a, as a sort of an enthusiast uh, for, for all kinds of things, for music, for Diamond de Gallus to, to punk rock, to whatever, to this kind of writer, that kind of writer. He had, uh, he was uh, like an amorphous, shuggeth like creature in the sense that he was constantly gobbling up culture all around him in all different forms all the time. <laughs> and he had, he loved everything that was, he, he loved everything good. <laughs> and so he, he had an endless appetite for the, the good stuff. And he was only then just kind of tentatively putting up his feet onto the ice to try to start, <clears throat> start writing on his own. And we get, so was, I got to see him start reading. We would always read something we were working on out loud to each other in these little meetings or, and share ideas feedback and whatever and uh he would you know he would watch him thinking absorbing and you could see you could watch him grow right in front of you uh you could watch him he was always thinking he had you know he he had something in him that he wanted to say and 
he was a little too shy and self-conscious at first to really, that might sound strange connected with Joe, but he had a very mod, he was a very modest person. He'd never, to my knowledge, uh, he was always, if anything, very self-effacing and tended to, to, I think, to underrate himself rather than overrate himself. He would look at other people and say, those are the real writers. I'm just kind of along for the ride. Um, but secretly, <laughs> behind the scenes, he was developed, he was, he had his own distinct voice. And, you know, you just, all you have to do is look at a page and that's Joe. <laughs> so you flip open the book and no one else wrote pages that looked like that. With, you know, dots and cross outs and all the rest of it, they, they were using every, and that's what he was like, using every resource that he could get his hands on. So if he says, okay, we need fear in a, in a bigger font, you know, right over here, we need to, we'll do it. I'll use the spacing. If he could have gotten different colors in here, he would have done it. He would have color coded the text. He would have color coded the pages. He would have had a pop-up section that you probably wouldn't want to open in front of young people. You would have had, uh, you know, like a bit of, um, like a musical stripe going down the side. There'd be a film strip. I mean, you know, he would, uh, he would adapt. He had a sort of, a voice that could adapt to pretty much any medium. You could really easily imagine him doing movies. You could really easily imagine him writing songs. Uh, and it was, it all connects to what Mike was talking about, and I'm sure other people will relate to the, the, uh, his deep enthusiasm, as you say, that passion, that love of art and poetics poetry in particular, he just had an innate sense of it, an innate love of it. And it was just, that was part of who he was right down to the bone, just like smoking cigarettes, just like uh, dressing lightly in cold weather. <laughs> that was, that was Joe. He was, he loved poetry. He loved beauty. That's what he loved. Really. He loved beauty. And like all of us, perhaps he looked around and didn't quite see enough of it. And in the world and like all too few of us, he actually tried to do something about it. He actually tried to make it, create it, and he gravitated toward anybody who cared about it. And so that is what made, it, made him such a good editor. It's what made him such a good friend and a good colleague. He was, you know, and, and I think we, we all talk about how he supported everybody because he was cheering us all on to make beautiful work and to, and, being around Joe, I'll, I'll close with this because I don't want to overstay my, my welcome. But the, uh, Joe, because he sort of started out identifying himself as a fan and because he was a reader and because he would read you, he wouldn't just say he read you, he'd actually read you. <laughs> and he'd say, I love that part. And he loved, and he's, and you remember, yeah, right. This is for people, right? This isn't just something I do in, a, in my room and like send off to some magazine that never talks to me. This is actually, there, there are people on the other end who receive this and it actually is very, can be very, very meaningful to them. A relationship with, with, with beauty that you share with them, not so much something you do for them, but I don't know if that makes sense, but he, yeah, you, you couldn't forget that around him. Um, it's not that he kept you honest. Oh, well, he did, but he um, he kind of brought a whole room full of people in with him whenever he came in. You were always aware of the people he was talking connected to. You knew that what you mentioned to him would get around, and next thing you know, like twenty five other people would be in a project. So, what can I say? The uh, and he had the the voice right uh, to brave the windmills for a mere glimpse of redemption. And she, and she emphatically didn't want death. Not now. <laughs> All one word. And then down here it says, she came here to find life, to bloom and be glad, to be in the arms of a beautiful young lover who gave his treasures as freely as his perfect kisses. Lily didn't want death, she wanted celebration. But the king, call him doom or destiny or the grim reaper or the collector of souls or cessation or simply death, wanted her for his celebration. 
you can open any book by Joe at random and pretty much find a passage like that. So here's to Joe. It was a privilege to be his friend. I can tell you many times, uh, Michael, that uh, we must have had, I don't know, several hundred video chats over the years for absolutely no reason at all other than just to say hi and then there was a lot of there were a lot of days where he'd be working in his office and i'd be working in my office and we'd leave that video line on and not necessarily talking all the time but just like this feel of you know, I'm working in the same room with Joe. He's working in the same room with me. Uh, my point is that he talked about you. And when he did, maybe you know this, but he really held you. He was in awe of your writing and your voice. So if you don't know that, I would like you to know that. I mean, thank so, you. So, yeah. This is me having my hand up. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 don't be sorry. You're the most important person in the room, Kat. Oh, got it. Um, <laughs> I, I know I'm supposed to remain quiet until the end like everyone else, unless we start. No, 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 no. It's, a, it's a loose... Yes, we it's a all loose, went um, thread. Yeah. But um, on, the danger, on the danger of either making Mike very happy or very sad, um, did he admire your writing? Yes, you know this. Here's something you don't know. Um, you have this very specific style of setting up a manuscript, you know, the small, very small font and a very specific font. I found uh, the beginnings of several novels from the late 90s, 96, 97. They are in the very same font. If there's anything else you need to know, go ahead, but I think that's one of the cutest gestures of really liking somebody's work I've seen in a long time. And it's hell on my eyes. Get a decent font, Cisco, please. <laughs> Thank you for telling me that. Yes, I know. I don't like that tiny font. Actually, I insisted on a bigger font for some of my later works for precise. I was hurting my eyes, too. Ah, there you go. <laughs> well, but, you know, uh, if, if you're watching this and you're you're not that familiar with Joe Pulver, uh, Joseph S. Pulver Sr. Is, is how he appears on his books. Um, you know, please take the opportunity to read his work. Uh, I, I have for years uh, had a URL, joepulver.com, which um, I, I shoots over to his Amazon page. Uh, if I remember correctly. So if you, all you got to do is remember joepulver.com. It's going to take you uh, right to Amazon. Let me double check myself. Because <laughs> I'm a double checker. And yes, joepulver.com takes you to his Amazon page. So last last but not least with, with Cisco, um, so talking about Joe's work, you have a new book that I'm very excited to read. Could you just maybe take 30 or 40 seconds and tell us what it is because it looks just so fascinating and so timely. Oh, he's going to go get it. No, you Slowly. made him leave. You made him yeah. leave, Mike. Yeah, Damn it. Storming. He's running. I'm storming off. No, this is the this is the, <laughs> this is the hard copy. Uh, I think that's the one you mean. Anti society. Yes. Right. This is a collection from Grimscribe. This is the hardcover, which unfortunately is already sold out, but there's a soft cover that just became available. And it's also available on, as a pay what you want uh, ebook on the Grimscribe page. And actually, we're working on uh, hopefully getting an audiobook version of it uh, put together as well, which uh, might be very well read by me if I can get a quiet enough. I was about to ask, enough. yeah. If I can get it quiet enough around here <laughs> to record. But anyway, this is a collection that I put together. And actually, Joe might have had a little bit to do with this book. I Because it's a, just briefly, it's 10 stories. And I decided I wanted to write a book that would be like a record album. Like all the, all the tracks, of every story is about the same length. And they're all more or less on the same theme of isolation and loneliness. So it's anti-societies. It's from Grimscribe Press. 
And uh, if nothing else, it's a handsome volume. Uh, so uh, it'll look nice on your shelf. My, you my two cents is an audio book from Michael Cisco. I, I can't see anyone but Michael Cisco doing it justice. I mean, how do you read a Michael Cisco short story? You know, he, he should be the one reading it. I don't know. John Paget is a who runs. That's true. Shows. He's an outstanding. He's phenomenal. Yeah, he's and, phenomenal. Uh, yeah. So um, he's he suggested he might want to do some readings here, and I would not dare say no, even if he wasn't my publisher. But uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I love listening to him read. So if you have, and for that matter, if you haven't heard, heard John Paget read, or in fact read his stuff, including Secrets of Ventriloquism, that book that he put out, it, that's, they're, they're really great. You, they're, you know, they're really yeah. great. One of the really previous great. books I've ever read. Yeah, really. Secrets really of Ventriloquism. <laughs> Last I'll say, Mike, Michael, is that you and I share a common bond. We uh, uh, both read uh, Daniel Pinkwater. We're about the same age. We both de read Daniel Pinkwater when we were young. The Snark Out Boys and the Avocado, Avocado of Death, Alan Mendelssohn, The Boy from Mars. Those which are my the favorite. The Worms in Africa. Which one is that? Where they go I, to the, uh... I don't remember that one. Oh, uh, that, I must have read to... Alan Mendelssohn five times. <laughs> yeah, Lizard Music over and over. And But that one, one about the worms had some one of the funniest passages I've ever read. And it was absolutely a scream. And he's Daniel Pinkwater is still with us. He's still, he's like post pictures on twitter and stuff he's still around. yeah yeah he's on twitter yeah, yeah. his byline is famous author i think so <laughs> <laughs> everything's a bit of a snark with daniel pinkwater i think so anyway um who would who would like to talk next about that uh, thank you michael cisco uh who would like to talk next about joe jeff you want to say something yeah sure I'll, yeah Oh, wow. It's hard to encapsulate, you know, your relationship with somebody like that, a, a friend like that. Joe and I, um, we would have become, I was probably aware, I was, I'm sure I was aware of him in the 90s. We became close 2001, uh, shortly after I read his novel, Nightmare's Disciple. And, um, and uh, I, don't, I don't really remember how it started out that we became more closely, close friends. But um, shortly well, around that time, we started, you know, having phone conversations and so forth, you know, and a phone conversation could last four hours, you know, and, and, and like Michael was saying, talking about culture and uh, just his, his passion, indeed, uh, he epitomized it about um, anything, any, any form of uh, entertainment. But um, so um, around that time or shortly thereafter, he, he was uh, starting up his own publishing company, Hive Press. And he put out uh, uh, a book uh, by Ann K. Schwader, uh, The Worms Remember, I think is the title. And, uh, and so he was going to, he wanted to do a novel of mine. And so uh, um, I started writing a novel for him uh, and then, um, which was, turned out to be Monstrosity. And it was a punk town novel, novel in my punk town setting, but with the uh, Lovecraftian elements. And unfortunately, Hive Press, um, he wasn't able to maintain it. But he inspired me to, to write that novel and I, I, I completed it and, and, and sent it elsewhere. So I, I credit him a lot with, with uh, inspiring me to write that book, which led to some re really good opportunities, people who saw that book and, and, and doors opened. And, and, uh, and I, I thank him for that. He, he was very inspirational, uh, very enc always encouraging your work and inviting you to his projects and he was one of the things that i think is most distinctive about him it, it was is his as an editor he was a superb editor uh he knew just what kind of talent to bring to a certain project he even told me one time i'm not bringing you into this project because I, I don't i don't associate you with so much of this bring me in on something else uh but his his themes were always fascinating you know uh, a the uh, uh, an anthology inspired by Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, you know, uh, uh, an anthology uh, tribute to Thomas Ligotti. This book real quick, uh, what a magnificent looking book and, and such great stories. The yeah. Madness of Dr. Caligari. And, and who else would come up with a theme like that? And it, and that's what, I loved his ideas like that. You know, the, the Grim Scribes puppets, 
uh, and so on. And he had other, you know, he had others lined up, others planned that uh, because of his health, he wasn't able to, to see to fruition, which is a shame because he had some other fascinating projects down the road. Uh, like uh, Born Under a Bad Sign was was uh, one of the, the latter uh, projects he was planning. And uh, he's all, it was exciting. He'd always invite me and he'd give me, maybe give me kind of some, like a leaves of an Economicon. It's not the one that, that unfortunately didn't come out while, while he was alive, but it, it's supposed to be coming out. Oh so, man, he spent so many afternoons talking to me about how excited he was for that project. Yeah, he, you know, he, he and, and, um, and then there was interesting projects that didn't see, again, that didn't see fruition, like he was going to do a tribute to um, the Brothers Quay, the, the animators, the Brothers Quay. That didn't work out because I think that he, he wanted to get their, uh, their approval on that. And, and they, I think they felt they weren't keen on that. I think they, uh, but anyway, he just, just that, that kind of, those kind of ideas. And uh, his enthusiasm I, was always so contagious. Yeah, After indeed. you talked to Joe, you were always inspired to go back and whatever your creative pursuit was to double time it, you know? Absolutely. He 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 inspired you directly and indirectly. He, you know, directly he'd, he'd say, write a story for this, you know, anthology or whatever. But indirectly, just as, you know, you, you absorb his enthusiasm and you observe it, and you, you absorb it. And... Uh, and and that inspires you about how to uh, interact with the with the creative ether, or whatever. How to how to redefine yourself and observe yourself, and and how I, years ago I, I, I um you know I I've, I've been drawing and writing stories since I was a kid, but I, I made this friend where at, at, at the play, first place I worked a boot factory, and uh, he was an artist and a, and a poet. And he, one time I went over his apartment and he was showing me his paintings and everything. And he said, this painting, I, I drawing, I did with, uh, I call it coffee and butts. I did it with coffee grounds and cigarette ash. And it, and it was like a kind of an epiphany for me. It was like, because I was so into my own world. I, I wasn't, I didn't know how other art, artists thought and, and interacted with their art. And that's kind of, kind of a comparison I'm making with how it was with Joe. He like it kind of opened my eyes to another artist's, perception another artist's creative spirit and and pursuits and uh inspired me in, in much in that way that my friend did years ago to open my my eyes to a bigger broader kind of horizons uh, in terms of art, your artistic pursuits seeing through other artists eyes i think it's a valuable uh, indispensable kind of a uh, exercise and and i can't think of anybody who who was more inspirational in that way than than Joe. Like I said, you know, not just in what he would literally show you these creative projects that he would literally invite you to, or that you saw him producing, and that you saw him writing, uh, such as this novel, The Orphan Palace, which I think is is his magnum opus. But just observing him as an artistic spirit, he was pure art, artistic spirit. He really was. Um, someone, or excuse me, Carol, on the live chat asked a minute ago, uh, for those new to Joe Colbert's work, what do you recommend starting with? Um, I'll say real quickly that Joe was a powerful editor and a powerful writer. So, you know, if you want to see the books he edited, and start with the books he edited, you know, maybe The Madness of Dr. Caligari or something. Uh, Michael Cisco said in our side chat, which the public can't see, um, that his recommendation was uh, start with a collection like Blood Will Have Its Season or Sin and Ashes. Yep, there it is. So, uh, so yeah, um, I remember that the first book I read of his, I think it is important to note, please guys disagree with me if, 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 if you think I'm wrong. But Nightmare's Disciple, he told me at least five times that it's he started writing it because he wanted to learn to type, which he never did. He handpicked his entire career. I don't know how the hell he got so much done doing that, you know, hunting, packing. Uh, but that's how he did. That's how he created Nightmare's Disciple. 
but then his my point I'm trying to make is that his later work he seemed to in Nightmare's Disciple is a nice Lovecraftian crime novel. But his work after that is he was like he really found his voice. So could I just comment? Yes. Uh, he mentioned once when he was writing Nightmare's Disciple, he had never really written anything long form before like that. Mm -hmm. And he is just like putting in everything. And I think heavily encouraged by Bob Price. And uh, I don't think that reflects, it, it was like a, a first time to put words on paper. And he kept maturing throughout his career with writing. And I think, I think his writing is demanding. It's sort of sui generis. It's, um, especially the later the work you get into it, it's like you're reading inside the mind of the protagonist, like it's stream of consciousness. And so it's a lot more, a bad word, conventional in his earlier collections than later. And it, it, if you start with the earlier collection, like I would agree with uh, Michael Sisko, Blood Will Have Its Season. As you get into his writing, you mature into that style with him. I think that would be the best approach for someone new to Joel Pulver, if I might be so bold to say. Yeah. And Jeff, what do you think? I think I agree totally with 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 uh, Matt. I I I, it, I enjoyed Nightmare's Disciple, but the the stuff that came after, I don't think I've ever seen anybody just uh, find their voice so um, dramatically and quickly. You know, I don't I don't think of Nightmare's Nightmare Disciples as that's not that doesn't reflect Joe's the purity of, of his voice. Not not to discourage anybody from reading it by any means. It's very entertaining, but it's 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 so different from what came after. And I and yeah. I was yeah. I felt privileged to watch that that progression. And uh, once it seemed like once he found his his voice, then it, it, it just kind of exploded from him, and he he recognized it. And, and, and really um, tuned into it. And, uh, but I, I would definitely recommend people, somebody would, uh, to read one of his collections. Uh, and and I, I'm uh, like, uh, I'm partial to uh, House of Hollow Wounds because I edited that one, you know, so I have a, a real uh, um, relationship with that one. And it was challenging uh, editing, Joe. I, Jesus, I edited- Tell me about it. <laughs> oh my God. I, I, I get, I get calls way. from him like, it's not precisely spaced right here. And I'm like, oh, God. Holy. <laughs> yeah. I spent a lot of time. <laughs> I, I was editing the House of Hollow Wounds and another one called St Stained Translations. Edit. And uh, it took me a long time. I felt guilty, like I thought, like, I hope it's not, I'm not holding them up here. But um, my the way I would edit something is if I see some kind of reference to a song or a book or, or, or the uses of some French word or whatever. I, maybe I'm OCD about this, but I got to look it up to make sure it's spelled correctly. That it's right. that it's it, it's going to you know. And and he works in a lot of that stuff in his in his work. And so I was looking up stuff left and right, and and uh, just kind of worried that when that, this saw its final form, that it would maintain the 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 like Michael was saying, the the formatting was so important. It was the structure of the story. On when you when you see it is not just the words and what the meaning they convey so it was uh it was very challenging challenging to um and challenging to convert to kindle <laughs> i mean just how do you do that I imagine, you know? I imagine but uh so rewarding though so rewarding. right so we, we've got a qu couple Mike, questions hold yes on. yes i want to i want to comment on this because so yes. many many years ago i i found a copy of the first edition of william s burroughs wild boys and the blurb on the cover says, more lucid than naked lunch. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best blurb they could come up with. <laughs> but when I see that now, I think about Joe in relationship between Nightmare's Disciple and his later work. Nightmare's Disciple is, is pretty much a traditional Lovecraftian novel mixed with the police procedural. What comes next in Joe's life is a complete loss of lucidity, 
and a descent into madness, wordplay on an extreme level that is recursive and just drives you insane like it should and makes you question what you're, the, what you're reading in terms of, of both its literary value and the effect that it's having on you. And sometimes, it, 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 I think to a lot of people, it looked like stream of consciousness writing. And Joe, on more than one occasion when we were, you know, chatting, get a little upset about that. He's like, this is not a stream of consciousness. I'm working my ass off to right. get it precisely this way. Yes. You know? He yeah. said that yeah. to me one time. I think I mentioned, I even used the words in, in my introduction to House of Halloween's. I think I said it was, it's kind of like stream of consciousness. And he... He he said to me, I, "It's it's not. I I I yeah. pour over every word. I, I agonize over every word. It's it might look like that, and 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 that's and it's great that it, it has that feeling. But he said, uh, no, everything is very thought out and, and methodical." A uh, couple comments and questions. First of all, Christina Mole. Uh, hope I'm saying your last name right, Christina. Mike, can you say hi to Jeffrey Thomas, please? When you can, thank you. <laughs> my favorite author so uh and robin chang uh, i'll just present this to everybody you're, you're we're all his friends and to cat as well of course what was joe's favorite book did, or did he have one or was it you know just oh, well, I, typed, I typed in, in the chat he told me once that flicker by theodore rozak was his favorite novel but he was such an enthusiast about things he might have a different favorite novel all the time but he, yeah. you know he um, he, he, put, he also at a bookstore once put a copy in my hand and said, you buy this. So <laughs> Flickr is good. Yeah. Yeah. You wanted to say something? Flickr is one of the things he would back when he could still read at least once a year. So that definitely qualifies for favorite. Um, oh God. What is it? Games of Angels, I think. I can't come up with the last name. I, I'm going to chime back in later and tell you who wrote this. <laughs> um, and um, one of the things that were inspiring as heck was uh, Ricci, City of Night, mm. just from the word play. And Good to know. So, when, so people write those down and read those too, so I'm talking to the audience. He also, right. really, lo he also really loved the, cr <laughs> the crime writer Ken Bruin, an Irish crime writer. Um, and I've read those books in there. I think there's actually a lot... Uh, I kept Joe used to um, complain a lot about not being better read, uh, having more people read his work, and he'd just say, "I just got to put weird stuff and weird, you know, style in my stories, and it's fun, and that's how I do it." But no one wants to read that stuff. But I would point at Ken Bruin, who did, did that kind of stuff. He would make long lists of weird stuff in the middle of his stories and weird formatting. But he's kind of a bestseller, and I would say, just do more like Ken Bruin, you know? Is it possible? You know. Um... I told Joe this story once, and I'll be brief uh, because I know you, you know, uh, as most of you know, I love old time radio theater. Okay, so so mystery theater aired mostly in the 70s, and a lot of the stories were hokey, and, and some of them were good. I, I just love listening for nostalgia, but there's this one story about a writer, as a matter of fact. He's, he's like mid-40s, and he's feeling old, and he writes these really different kinds of novels and he's got this cult following meaning which we all know what that means a, a small relatively speaking following but that just absolutely love what he's doing and by the end of the episode the writer comes to understand that it's not about the number of people that read the book that these these readers of his are getting so much out of what he's doing and redefines his rules for success so i don't know if that actually helped joe or not or you know he might have had me on me uh might have turned down the volume when i was talking to and it's equally possible <laughs> and i also wanted to say mike griffin remember the time that joe was we were at santa your house at a con and uh, me and joe with you guys and uh, thanks again by the way and joe's going on and on about bavarian soundhouse uh, that's the title, right? Uh, sound sound studio. Studio. Oh, yes. Studio. Oh, it's Berber Berberian Sound Studio, yeah. Yeah, he's going on about 
what a fantastic, creepy movie this is. So we all start watching it. 20 minutes in, Joe's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> he was asleep, asleep sitting straight up. Well, yeah. my life. Mm -hmm. Like Joe? Joe? Forget it. It's out. Jeff, is there You're anything good. else you want to say before no, I'm, we I'm good. I, I think we But before we leave, Jeff, uh, yes. just things. A, um, I don't know if you can see me laughing at the while you were talking it's really cute how you say he inspired you to continue monstrosity mm -hmm. from what i remember his words when he came back to this and he often did included something like kicking your ass to finally get it done <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah. It's, it's nice yeah, i've had that experience with uh, john langan mm, it's it's, yeah. it's nice to know that in the memory now it's uh, inspiring you i like that um <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, yes, Nightmare's Disciple is non-typical Polva in its own way it is. Um, he's got the lists, he's got the references, all the stuff, because Beast Wars lists, oh God. Um, it already shows his humor, because somewhere in the book, um, what's the typical term? Um, everything um, plus the kitchen sink. Hmm. Um, yeah. And he was very proud to say that Nightmare's Disciple actually had two kitchen sinks in it. <laughs> I so read that book before I knew Joe. And I, I thought about this. There was a couple thoughts I had about this book. In the beginning, uh, this lady comes home and she's feeling kind of lonely if memory serves. It's been years since I read it. And it's, it's winter out and everything. And she's like, I think I'll just stay in and read a book. Maybe I'll read uh, Winter Prey by John Sanford. And I thought, I love the Prey books. Uh, I don't know who this author is, but he loves books. I can just tell. You know, and then he, that, that, that uh, uh, store, I can't remember the names that, that, you know, that was maintained by these two guys. I just felt like it was so real. The Moral Comics fans. Yes. It was. It's based on a um, place called Fantaco, one of the first places to actually hold a fant uh, fantasy and comic convention. These people uh, existed. They were about as real as you could get them without naming names. Yeah. Um, Michael Cisco, yes, the answer to your question is CBS Radio Mystery Theater with E.G. Marshall. Uh, I'll try to remember the name of the particular episode, but it is, it's just real good about defining rules for success. You know, um, we can't all be Stephen King, but we have people that are inspired and count that are counting on what we do. Right. That's a good feeling. Well, and we shouldn't all be Stephen King, not that there's anything wrong with him, but there's already a Stephen King. Right. <laughs> Well, I meant in terms of sales, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah, but it's yeah, that's the thing. It's like not everybody's going to sell a lot, but you, you know, yeah, uh, I know, I know that. But there's, uh, you, you don't. Are you here to make money, or are you here to to be to make art? Uh, I mean, what really matters? I don't think I is, could not I agree more. Yeah, and money is I'm nice. Sure. I'll take money, but that yeah, shouldn't yeah. be the principal reason. No, never. Um, and you could eventually be recognized as an artist after your life. Right. This happened with Lovecraft. Um, all right. Before we move on, I, I think I'd like to go to John Lincoln next. Um, but I've got a question. Huh? I said, what? Yeah. That guy. No one needs to hear from him. Well, that's what Cisco said before you got here. But anyway. As, I mean, he was right. Absolutely. Adam Taylor says, uh, evening folks, hi, Kat. Can anyone talk about what started Joe's enthusiasm for the yellow sign? And of course, I'm, he did, that, that was the end of his question, but of course the king and yellow mythos and, and so forth. Does anybody want to tackle that? Sis, Cisco, you might be the, I don't know who's the best. I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think that what I, um, my recollections here are a little vague, but I know that his interest in the, in chambers goes back to, just goes pretty much all the way back. I think that 
you know, as he was getting to know more mythos writers, you know, he goes, he went back to King and Yellow, which was not, you know, I mean, nowadays it's not exactly a household word, but more people, but people at least know the phrase. They may not know who Chambers is or read the stories, but at least they know the phrase. And there's a stereotypical version of the King in Yellow, of the yellow sign, if you've read right. it. I think, <clears throat> um, I think that, um, you know, it might have been something that happened um, when we were all getting together again at Bob's. I think there might, we might have been talking about the sort of mythos adjacent stuff, you know, and, and the way that, for example, Carcosa is originally from Bierce. It's from uh, Haita the Shepherd, I think, is the name of the story by Bierce, where, that, where, the, where the city of Carcosa is first mentioned. And I think it's uh, strongly suggested somewhere that Chambers got swiped that from Bierce. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Shepherd as Haster, inhabitant of Carcosa as Carcosa. Yeah, okay. I mean, so Haster was first mentioned in Height of the Shepherd? Yes. I know that was Bierst for sure. I just forget there's two stories that are candidates for that. But, you know, so it was kind of not the knock on effect of reading Lovecraft, and then you start to read the various people Lovecraft read. And, uh, you know, it seems sort of like different people would develop their own particular specialized interests, you know, whether it would be Mac and Blackwood or, or uh, people like that. And we were all discovering these writers because again, the internet was primitive. It wasn't really that readily possible to get your hands on these books and all the time off. And you had to go to a li actual library. Remember those? And you'd have to go get one. Yeah. It's, uh, it's like you, you start with Lovecraft and then depending on your particular mindset, you start to branch off into different areas of weird fiction that interest you. Right. And so if you're reusing supernatural horror in literature as a reading guide, I mean, the last part of it is pretty much all Mac and Blackwood and some others, uh, and M.R. James, you know, so I mean, I know that I looked up, I would not have heard of Mac and if I hadn't, that's how I learned about Mac and Blackwood, certainly. Not sure about M.R. James. I think I vaguely knew him before, but like, People like M.P. Scheel, I mean, forget it. There's only one reason M.P. Scheel is republished now, and that's not because he's bad or anything, but because Lovecraft mentioned him. Um, I'm sure that Mackin got a big boost that way too. But anyway, so did Chambers. I'm pretty sure Chambers, as popular as he was back, I mean, I don't know, he was prolific anyway in his own lifetime, but I think that he he owes a lot of his, his uh, I mean, nobody would have known the yellow sign or any of that stuff now if it wasn't for the fact that Lovecraft had mentioned him and that, you know, he, he, the Lovecraftian interest pulled Chambers in. And then I think that, that um, I'm trying to remember if Bob had tried to put together some sort of um, anthology or something like that having to do with Chambers or whatever, but maybe that was sort of around the place where, where Chambers kind of really began to show up on Joe's radar as an increasingly important point. And it became clear over time that he really was diving really deep with Chambers, that he actually was coming to sort of identify with Chambers and become a real Chambers expert, that he was actually acquiring sort of, you know, scholarly grade familiarity with Chambers' life and work. So I, it certainly was underway by the time that, that uh, I got to know him. It's but I, it, I suspect the seeds had been planted a bit earlier. They had been. Um, he had, uh, he's always been a voracious reader. And I think it was in his late teens when he, for the first time, came across Chambers. And we've all been there. Something just hits you and it holds on to you and it's on your back and it bites you in the ankles and it will not let go. And that happened to Chambers. I have a, an old manuscript via Hive Press that never came to be from the late 90s and that already includes a lot of, it's a, a Lovecraft to Chambers anthology and I have a ton of old stories from the mid 90s and Chambers is already right there. It's not the book that we used to, it's the poetry uh, that has been unpublished that talks a lot that, that just shows what he would later dare to write down. And you can see how restrained he is. Um, but there's already a lot of chambers in that as well. And crap, there's short stories that haven't been finished from the late 90s. So it's like, okay, 
ICV influence. Mm -hmm. No, Chambers has been there. In the back of his mind, it's always been more yellow than green. Uh, by the way, first things first, I'm sorry. Hi, Adam. How cool. Thank you for chiming in. Uh, forgive me, my brain's not firing on all cylinders today, but Mike Griffin, did, did we speak with you? I think we did. Not really. No, I mean, I spoke up, but I didn't do my talk with Joe. Yeah, okay. Um, why don't we have you go next and then and then laying in. Uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> Mike, just yes. to finish something from the previous discussion. Yes. Call Edward Wagner's uh, River of Night streaming had a major effect on Joe as far as how to interpret the Cosmos and Missiles. Uh, Mike Griffin. Yeah. How and when did you meet Joe and, and tell us about who, who was Joe to you? you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I met Joe on Facebook, actually, uh, maybe 2010 or so, 2010 or 11. And it was more of like, a, actually, I think my wife, Lena, met Joe first. And it was something where some of the writers that I was interested in and I was I was following their, I don't know, Facebook presence um you know people uh, make comments on each other's stuff and you get to know other people just by friends of friends and that's kind of what joe was uh seeing joe comment on things i remember long long ago him talking about uh commenting on maybe you know john or, or laird baron or uh uh you know writers like that that i was first getting into at, around that time and uh Lena became friends with Joe and so did I. And, it, and really we just became, you know, kind of pals. At that time I wasn't get really published much at all, um, maybe a little, but we just talked a lot about music and uh, chatted through Facebook chat and a lot of emails. And then after a few of that, of those doing Joe's very favorite way of communicating, which was to have five hour Skype conversations. And uh, which he would always say, it'll just be a quick one. So let's just talk by chat on uh, Skype chat, but then you get going and of course, it would go and go and go. Uh, and it's fun, but you couldn't get him off. You couldn't stop, you know. Um, so lots of those. And you just get to, you know, just got to know him as a friend really more than as a writer, editor, public, you know, those kind of relationship. That that started as I, um, as my writing um, kind of, as I started getting my own writing out there. And then as Joe uh, was doing anthology editing, um, sort of coincided where my writing was reaching a level and he was doing an anthology that he, invited me to to where um you know that where our uh relationship as kind of writer and then editor protege you know matt well, that kind of relationship developed where really for a long time it had just been friends talking about comic books and music and stuff um and so i got to uh after that after you know a couple of years of being friends uh, he was doing the groom scribes puppets actually i think he was just finishing up a season of carcosa but it was pretty far along and my, uh, you know, the timing wasn't right. So he said, uh, I won't, you know, won't invite you to this, but maybe I'll let you send me something for Air Room Stripes Puppets. And um, it worked out. I, the, my favorite part of telling this story is about John Langan. I had to wait until, um, he, he told me I'll let you submit a story if there's a room, but I'm still waiting to hear about the submission from John Langan. And as everyone knows, John Langan will often miss a deadline or be a little past the deadline. And he will often write a, a lengthy story. And so an editor who's, who wants a Langan story in their book will say, I better wait and I better leave a big chunk of pages available because you never know what kind of mega story Langan's going to submit, you know, three weeks after the deadline. <laughs> so I'm so I'm wanting to submit something. And I actually, I think, did submit it. But Joe just said, it's not. I'm not going to be able to consider it until we figure out what the hell Langan's doing. So, like, I don't have to take this abuse from you. So I spent, at this time, I didn't know John personally. I only knew him as somebody who wrote book stories that I liked. But uh, I'm every day I'm just going, you know, God damn, can Langan just send in his story? I'm just so, like, get it going. I want to find out if my story is going to be in this book, you know? And so I had a lot of, um, you know, hostility toward John. That <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. Still hasn't dissipated really yeah. completely. Finally, though, John did submit his story, and it was lengthy, but not so long that it would overrun the, the, the word count limit for the book. And then Joe told me, you know, contingent on some edits and stuff, that my story would be in the Grim Sarps Puppets, too. And it worked out 
pretty well in the end. So that's why I'm not as have a, don't have as big a problem with John as, as I. Well, uh, I like to say about Lang in that it, he's late and it's always worth it. He did the same thing with Autumn Cthulhu as we talk about him, like he's not in the room. <laughs> and, I fi- and I finally got it. And I'm like, I'm like, John, this is a novella. He's like, well, I, 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 I know. And I read it and I just, I really fell in love with it. And I honestly, honestly feel he, he thinks I'm just being snarky, but I honestly feel it is one of the best novellas I've ever read. Uh, so John Langan's story in, uh, in Autumn Cthulhu. Not trying to get you to pick up Autumn Cthulhu, although it is uh, cheap on Kindle at the moment. So, um, and Joe has a story in it. Beth, Joe has a story in it. Laird has a story in it. Griffin, Jeff Thomas, Pete Relic, uh, some newer writers that I wanted to make room for, and and a lot of a lot of uh, more well known writers in the community. So, so yeah. Uh, anything else? Mike yeah, so I was just gonna, you know, just gonna say that uh, th- there was that stage of the relationship, and then you know, getting to meet Joe in person was a big thing, and happened uh, as Joe was a guest at the uh, Lovecraft Film Festival in Portland, and he stayed with us. You know, Mike, you you stayed with us around the same time, and uh, you know, getting to know a person, in, uh, you know, in the flesh, and taking them around to grocery stores, and um, he, he uh, stuck around for a while, and after the festival was over, we took him to the beach, and showed him around and um you know took him to some some restaurants got him to try some oysters which was something he thought he'd be afraid to do so you know you built a lot of good memories taking taking somebody on adventures and uh you know doing stuff that even years later you're still talking about lena and i still go to lincoln city and you know go certain places and it makes us think of joe and talk about joe because it was such a, a big thing to him uh, for some reason, I guess to see the, the Pacific Ocean for the first time, and to you know wade into the water, and um, you know eat an oyster, and have a seafood feast, and uh, just a lot of stuff, and uh, you know wh- where we would still share these pictures even years later after after that trip was over, we'd still you know talk about the, that trip and and share those pictures and all that stuff. So yeah, so that was. Uh, to, to me, the thing about Joe that I remember is just the, the fun and the enthusiasm as a friend and as a guy to hang around with. There's really was no, I don't know another friend or another person that is more fun and more engaging to be around and just hanging around with and chat about things than Joe. He's just endlessly, uh, you know, full of energy about things and enthusiasm and everything that you can come up with to talk about. He's got an opinion about it and has other ideas of other things that, that you might be interested in too. Um, so uh, but at the same time, with with all of that passion, underneath it is a is a kind person that really yeah. wants to help other writers, editors, and artists, yeah. and so forth, and, and encourage them. There's yeah. a quote that I I quoted this last year when I wrote about Joe, but I just want to, based on what you just said, Mike. Uh, and here it is: Sometimes in this life, you meet people who you might call large-souled, who are a privilege to know. And, you know, first time I, it, it, Joe fits that so well, <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly. Like you said, wanting to help other people, he was such an enthusiast for just uh, good writing and good people. And so many of the writers now that I have read and that I've become friends with, the work I enjoy are people that I got to know because he would, uh, he'd be talking uh, at length about planning this um, anthology and telling me about all the people he'd gotten for it. And he would tell me about those writers and why I should read this or that story or this or that book of that person. And uh, I feel like he really helped me and a lot of the other people that I know widen our awareness of who was doing interesting work. And um, not only just with this person to person talking about other writers, but also just, just reading the people he chose for his books was a great way of finding out who's doing interesting stuff in the community and who's, whose work is worth uh, searching out and reading more of because he was publishing, uh, you know, so many of the great, most interesting writers that are around at, that t- at the time in the, say, you know, the 20 teens. Uh, you could read a, a Pulver anthology and see uh, not only the, the more established names that are out there, 
that um, that appear in a lot of anthologies, but also newer people that would be up and coming would be a good way of discovering them. What you said about meeting them, quote unquote, in person uh, in 2013, I believe you said, and and that would, I had been friends, and not just friends, but good friends with Joe for several years at that point, and never, you know, we did, like I said before, we did this, you know, half the day thing of you know, working and sometimes 15 minutes and nobody would say anything and then we'd be off on a tangent and everything. And We'd been doing that for quite a while. And then I thought, when I arrived at your house and he was there, I thought, is this, is it going to feel the same? And Joe saw me, ran up and hugged me, and I thought, there's no difference except, you know, the physical contact. You yeah. know, it, it, it was a great feeling. I, I felt like I did not just meet one of my best friends mm -hmm. just now, you know? Um, yeah, so. Lena, I remember Lena and I were on our way to the airport to pick Joe up and we were saying, isn't it going to be weird to see in person for the first time, not just somebody that we've met online and talked to a couple of times, but somebody that we feel we know very well online and finally see them in person. And we went up and like you, met, like you said, met him in the airport, went up, kind of hugged him and started walking with him. And it was just like we had, you know, exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like comfortable, like we've been together for a long time. Uh, uh, Mike, if you're done, uh, Kat's got something, and then we'll move over to John Langan. Sure. Uh, comment and a correction. <laughs> um, yes, uh, Joe had actually met or come across Lena on you, uh, YouTube on MySpace first, and for the longest MySpace. Season, uh-huh yes kids my <laughs> um um and for the longest time mike was actually referred to as lena's husband before he actually started writing um the other musician and the that's other how everyone refers to mike he just doesn't know it well once you've met lena you know why she's <laughs> that is true um, very nice lady and very talented lady that you got there mr griffin heck yeah um, and the other thing is, let's put things straight here. Joe was not looking forward to eating oysters. <laughs> <laughs> you made him do it so he would, after later on, be allowed to gorge on seafood. Remember the picture? Yeah, I think it was that was the deal. If you wanted the key lime pie and the other mm -hmm. stuff, you have to have an oyster. It's beautiful. <clears throat> it's like every Lovecraft ever looking at a piece of moving tentacle. <laughs> what the hell do I have to? All right, you can see he's being bright into something. All and right, let's uh, give Langan a taste of his own medicine and delay him some more. <laughs> <laughs> I kid because I love John. <laughs> uh, Robin Chang says, can panelists say more, if possible, about Joe's relationship, direct and indirect, to Carl Edward Wagner and his writing and editing? Does anyone want to tackle that? Or does anyone feel qualified to tackle that? Because I'm, I'm certainly not. I'm just waiting to see if anyone else has something to say before I throw my one and a half cents in. I don't know. Did he ever meet? No, I don't, Carl, think, I don't think so. No. Uh, he, he loved his writing. He loved uh, his taste in horror. Uh, he loved that he put so much passion into his work. I think in some ways he saw that in himself and i can say i think although cat will correct me but you could tell he loved his writing when for a river of night streaming it's like one of the few stories where he would say that belongs in the king in yellow canon and that would tell you how highly he thought about it uh but it was also just uh that Wagner was so widely read, so widely respected, had strong opinions, and uh, loved new authors also. I think that's one of the things he liked about him. Uh, you remember how pissed off he'd get when people would act like uh, the King in Yellow mythos was part of the Cthulhu? Ooh, don't say mythos. it. Don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> oh, God. I've listened to many a lecture on that. I'm like, Joe, I, I've heard this before. <laughs> Don't give him the soapbox. You knew how he yeah. was going to get. 
Yeah, you know, speaking of the soapbox, I want to get this out, and then and then we really are going to talk to John Langan. If if you go to the Lovecraft Easing YouTube page, uh, you know, go to YouTube, type in Lovecraft Easing. All right, so the, there's a there's playlists, and I've got them in certain orders. The first one is the uh, the podcast that you're hearing us on right now, and obviously you can watch past podcasts too if you can't watch live. Uh, quiet horror and et cetera, things that Jeff Thomas, Scott Thomas and I are doing occasionally. And then I have a playlist and this was put together by Kat Pulver, but the playlist is on the Lovecraft Easing page. Now, people have said, I wish I, wish I knew Joe. I wish I could have met him in person. And I feel privileged that I did. And I, can see where you're coming from, you know, the more we talk about him. But you have, you have two ways to know Joe. First of all, through his work. And then secondly, there's got to be hundreds of hours in that playlist where Joe uh, where uh, where Joe is alive, so to speak. And you can see us chatting with him about this and that and you know with various guests and everything and um uh, so that that's there you you can watch those and and there there are quite a lot of them uh, thank you cat for putting that in order and i i wanted to put it on the main page so it would it would get as much exposure as possible so anyway with that said thank you um, for that Oh, thank you. Uh, let's move on to John Langan. Oh, God. Oh, is it, is <laughs> oh it time God, for me? Really? Is, it, is it time for me now? Is it, maybe oh, I'd like second. to hear wait from... Uh, we haven't talked to you, but never mind. Go ahead. Yeah, right, right. We need, we're going to have our, our, our phone-in uh, people oh, now. Wait, Mike, uh, before that, if I could just read into the record, there's a story in here Please. that I think encapsulate... <laughs> <laughs> your, right. words, your words are hurtful, Michael Sisko. Your words are hurtful. I, I missed the joke, whatever it was. There was no joke. There was no oh. joke at all. There was just cruelty. Cruelty? I missed the cruelty then. Uh, don't worry. You can Although watch it was the, probably justified. Yeah, watch the recording. Yeah, this will all be part of my lawsuit. Okay, I'll be sure to cut this part out. Excellent. <laughs> all um, right, John, um, how did you meet Joe? Um, you, you know, know the funny thing is... Whether he is, you, et cetera. I, I am sure, like, like I was at the um, previous run of Necronomicons, but before they become ne before they became Necronomicon Providence, when they were just Necronomicon, I was at the very last of them um, in 2001. And I know that Joe was there. I know that Michael Cisco was there. And, uh, and like, I, I think to myself, I don't remember us meeting, but maybe we did. You know, it's entirely possible that we were... Um, I I'm don't trying think to imagine a 30 year old Michael Cisco and I'm coming up empty. He was pretty much the same as he is now, actually, maybe uh, even a, a little older, actually. Okay. And, <laughs> um, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. There's and, a picture of all of us together. You can find it online, actually. From Cisco's the like, you're done, Mike. I'm never coming on this show again. <laughs> and, and I'll never he, work uh, in this town again, Davis. <laughs> you'll never, which, which town is that? The internet? Um, <laughs> So yeah, they were. Um, I know they were both there, and I've seen the picture of of uh, of of Joe and Michael there, and and Michael is dressing in color, which is weird. Um, and, Joe doesn't uh, yeah. have gray. Yeah, it. Uh, gray, anyway. Yeah, Joe doesn't have my. It's true. Um, and so there they are hanging out. So I, I like I think to myself like we we were probably at some of the same panels together, and I don't think we were on any panels together, but um, I'm sure we went to the blasphemous prayer breakfast together, and and. Um, you know, it's it's so so it's weird to think that like I was there with Joe, but I didn't I hadn't really gotten to know him, and and I think it probably was in person. Probably the uh, the first Necronomicon Providence uh, would have been our our first physical encounter, you know, uh, meet space encounter. But um, before yes. that, of course, I you know I had been invited to. Um, to be part of these anthologies, uh, the, the Chambers Anthology and the Legati Anthology, um, and then subsequently um, 
the uh, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari one, and he did a, a Ramsey Campbell one as well. And I just I could not get it together in time for that. And that's one of my great regrets is that I didn't uh, I didn't get a story into that one. But I, I guess the way that I I I, I feel like Joe had. Um, when we look at him now, like this almost outsized influence on, on what was going on, like it didn't seem like it as much because he was a fan, right? He was always a fan. He was an enthusiast. He, he was always pushing someone else's work. You know, he was he was never like me, 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 me. I mean, he might be pushing an anthology he edited, but it was because of the people who were in the anthology. He wasn't like, look at what right. a genius editor I, I am. And instead it would be, um, you know, have you read this story or this story or this story? And um, the same thing, the, the panels that, that I was on with him in the, in the more recent Necronomicons, um, he was always going on about other people's work and, and you have to read this person and you have to read that person. So I, um, on the one hand, I see him as, as this great enthusiast and promoter for, for other people's work. And at the same time, you know, he was bringing that work together in these anthologies that he was editing. And beyond that, you know, he, he sort of sat, um, you know, he's like one of these, like, like a sort of a contemporary equivalent of someone like Gertrude Stein or, or, or Sherwood Anderson or someone, one of these figures who he had like a sort of, if you will, like a kind of cyber salon, you know, like, like all these different people were connected, all, all these different um, talented people who were all working in the same weird end of the pool, but but doing their own weird little, I don't know, styles within it, you know, um, and so I, I think that um, that that's to say nothing of his of his own work, but but just to say that you know first off, um, you know he he I, I think the the anthologies that he edited, um, you know they 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 hold up they hold up in this really really substantial kind of way, and I I think to a large degree. Um, yeah, you know, the, the, the Chambers anthology probably benefited from True Detective, you know, the, there was some sort of bleed over from the King and Yellow thing, you know, but, but I, I also think that Joe in a lot of ways is really a major, maybe, maybe if not the major, a major figure in the kind of, I don't know what you'd call it, Chambers revival or, or whatever it is we're going through. I, I think that Joe really had a lot to do with, with that. Um, and I think, um, I, th I think that the, you know, you look at what he did um, with Casilda's song, you know, with, with trying, like he was always trying to, to, to get better in, in, in all sorts of different ways as, as a writer, but also as an editor and say, well, you know what, we're going to have this, you know, this, this is going to be all the, the best women I, I can, I can encourage to submit to my anthology. Um, and uh, as I recall, one of those stories won a world fantasy award, um, I think it was Selena Chambers, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, but of course, uh, Grimm's Crab's Puppets, the Ligotti anthology, uh, which is also full of insane and, and, and wonderful stuff, um, won a Shirley Jackson award, as I, as I recall. So he did, I'm, I'm, I'm gratified to say that, that he received some acknowledgement for, for his editing work. I, I, I wish he'd received more for his fiction, but, but I also think that, as Michael said, I mean, he took fiction writing with, with, I, I, I mean, and, and look, we never really talked about this. This was just the impression I got that, that he took it with just, you know, high seriousness, um, which is not to say that he couldn't have fun doing it, but that, that he loved it enough to try to give it his all. And, um, and, and for some reason, you know, I always think of him and Willem Pugmire together. Um, yeah. And I, I think of them as working within the, um, in some ways sort of central weird traditions, you know, whether, you know, sort of the Lovecraft circle in, in, um, in Willem's case or in, in Joe's case. Um, I mean, some Lovecraft stuff, I suppose, but, but more chambers and then also all these other different interests that he, that he had. Um, and, and they just, their, their kind of fidelity to their own visions really strikes me after, after all this time, the way that they just, um, yeah, in, in a just world, they both would have been rich um, and uh, or at least able to support themselves, you know, like like comfortably with their with their writing, you know. Um, but more and more, the the accomplishment of, of each of them seems to me just so substantial. You know, they, they seem I think sometimes horror maybe suffers the same problem that, um, oh, someone told me science fiction did. It was probably 
Ellen Datlow. Um, that, although maybe not. Anyway, the, the point is that like in science fiction, uh, uh, more is more, more is better, you know? And, and I, um, I think it was Gardner Dozois said, I'll never get the Grandmaster Award because I just haven't written enough, you know? And, and people were like, but Gardner, what you've written is really good. And he was like, yeah, but you know, we prize like the guy who writes a lot. And I think sometimes that horror can be like that too, because, you know, King in particular has been so prolific and even Ramsey Campbell, right, has, has been incredibly prolific that, that we, um, and both Joe and, and Willem were prolific, but, but not to Stephen King levels, right? You know, and, and so I, I think sometimes we, we forget that, that, um, that people can achieve a, a great amount without writing 60 books. And, and I think that what Joe, um, Joe accomplished as this kind of, um, you know, Renaissance man in, in some ways, right? Between the editing and, and the writing and the overall boosting, um, I mean, did you ever know a man who used more exclamation points? I mean, he was, of course, responsible for the great uh, exclamation point uh, deficit of, I think yes, it was 20, well, 2014. There, there were days, and, and, there were days had, when oh, none of us could use exclamation points. Yeah, you couldn't point. find an exclamation point. You were like, I need an, oh, no, it's not going to happen. All right, it's going to have to be another period. I'm yeah. going to have to, yeah. There's only yeah. so many allotted in any one day. No, said, I know. And I was, I was, you know, king of the exclamation points, man. But that's not... It, it's, point one year. Huh? I had to float him alone for exclamation points one year. <laughs> I remember. I remember you had some kind of crazy interest rate on that too, yeah, as, as yeah. I recall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got yeah. eighteen question marks out of that. Yeah, yeah. But he, um, like, that's almost not. That's not bad though. King of the exclamation points. In some ways, I think like that's not a bad title. You know, he's, he's the king in yellow, the mayor of Carcosa, um, but also you know a great, a great lover. You know, a, a great, a great. Um, <laughs> But you, all right, well, it, uh, but a, a great. No, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the moment you said that I was looking at Cisco moving around with great love, and it's like, did he mean to? No, okay, never mind. All right. By the way, I've got to chime out for a minute. It's not about you, John. I promise I'm going to be right back. Don't take it personal. No problem. Yeah. That's what they always say, and then, you know. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, that's that's someone else should talk now. Uh, I was just going to, uh, to one of your points was, uh, I've always liked, gravitated towards building communities, I guess. And uh, the, you know, at, at some point about 20 years ago, uh, this uh, um, simulated reality, Second Life, was really, really taken off. What I did was I, I had an island, what is what they referred to them, and it was all pure Bradbury, Autumn, um, you know, some Lovecraft thrown in somewhere, um, you, you name it. And I had like horror old time radio shows playing on the radio. I remember, you know, 90% of the people loved it. And I got, I had a bad day and I got a couple of bad comments from someone. And I, I told a friend about it and he said, it's, it, it's nice when people enjoy it. And it's nice when you get paid. You know, money is great, but it it should exist because it's beautiful. And I often think about that in terms of, of writing or editing or art or doing anything else. You know, um, what Cisco was saying a while ago about creating the art because you need to create the art uh, because it is, in some sense, beautiful to you and hopefully to others. So, yeah. Um, who we got left? Uh, Rick Lay, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, uh, I met Joe on the Easy podcast, and uh, this was about I think 2010. Mike, that sound right? I, I'd say 2011, maybe 12. Who was the first uh, Nick and I were going? Providence. 13, 2013. 2013, and it was 2012. And uh, we had a little problem using Google Chat back then. I had not been <laughs> set up for it. I thought you still used uh, something else. The buggy Google Chat. Well, I didn't get, I, I missed the test. 
I ended up talking to uh, somebody else from the UK. And then I, and the bottom line is I got into the podcast about 10 minutes late. And I didn't, we didn't go, I didn't have everybody introduced to me like we normally do to a guest. So Joe was talking and I had no idea who he was. And he mentioned that he had two literary gods, Robert Block and Robert W. Chambers. And it then dawned on me that I'm talking to Joe Pobra who I had read Name His Disciples and at least his uh, first collection by then, probably read his second. But will have its seasons and uh, the Sins uh, book. And then I, I was just shocked because I had loved his Name His Disciples um, even though that's atypical of his work, he, uh, I think, um, uh, outgrew Lovecraft, but, uh, found that he was not outgrowing Chambers, even though his approach to writing was very different from Chambers. I think, uh, he took the concept of Chambers of writing a coherent nightmare or a semi-coherent nightmare and just adopted it to uh, modern times. What I enjoyed talking to about Joe was that we were both uh, the same age, both born in 1955. And we had both grown up reading Marvel comics which may have affected why we both like Lovecraft. I think uh, the concept of a shared universe kind of inf inf influences your love of Lovecraft since he was tying in Robert E. Howard and Robert W. Chambers and everybody else. I always forget that term. What's that term again? Shared universe. No, the other one. Um, the reason why I invited you on the show. Oh, uh, oh well, that was for the Watt Newton universe. Why? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I got into, into in, interested in shared universe uh, series mainly because of Marvel Comics. Is that it? Geared my mind to major characters interfacing with one another, but. Um, Get back. We both love, more, and we both loved the recent MCU movies. And I loved discussing with Joe whether we thought they had done this character right or wrong. And uh, his favorite uh, Marvel superhero was Captain America. And we would get into very detailed discussions. Thank you. And I regret that uh, he's not here today. So I would love to discuss Falcon and the Winter Soldier. But... Hmm. Yeah. But that's what I miss. Besides his uh, humanity and his encouragement. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to say anything trite. Because I, I feel as lost so deeply, but at the same time, I'm grateful for the time that we did have with him. You know, and I, I don't mean that to sound trite, but that's that. That's how I feel about it. So, Rick, do you want to say anything else before we move on? Yeah, to I'll, yeah, I'll just say one more thing, just to get back into the uh, call Edward Wagner. Sure. Uh, I think Rivers of Nice Dreaming pointed Joe in the right direction of how to uh, approach Chambers. And uh, the only, but I don't think Wagner influenced him that much other than The Long Dark Rim Road, which uh, he recently put out. Yeah. 
that reminds me, it's about a group of uh, monster hunters in, uh, what, I think they're in Russia at some point in history. And they're, they turn out being as bad as the monsters they're pursuing. And I think he got that idea from uh, Wagner's Cain's story, Cold Light. But th that's all I have. That was the last book published in his lifetime, right, Cap? And yeah. And I'm I'm happy that I was the one to do it. He sent it to me just to say, hey, Mike, what do you think of this? And I'm like, oh, what do I think? We need to publish this novella, you know? So, so, so yeah. Rick, was that the one that was like, starts off there riding into dead DeMorant? Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, okay. It's called A Long Dark Grim Road. Uh, for those it's who a group heard. of monster hunters who are sort of acting like the Ku Klux Klan. And it's got a great cover by Dave Felton. So, and it's also available on Kindle, so for anyone interested. So, uh, Robin, uh, Robin Chang, Rick, says that was beautiful and substantial. Thanks, Rick. So, um, um, last but not least, and can, can I, can we get to, yes, I'm sorry. Since Robert Chang, uh, sent me a, uh, message on Facebook, but Facebook lost it. If, if you're listening, could you just send me that message? If we wanted some King of Yellow work I did or something. Uh, before we get to Cat, Pete, what, what would you like to talk about in regards to Joe? Uh, so, you know, my first introduction to Joe was, of course, you know, pre- pre-meeting him was reading A Nightmare's Disciple, which just simply blew me away. And, you know, to, to me, it's it's a toss up between that book and Cody Goodfellow's Radiant Dawn series, of the best modern mythos novels that really set off what could come next and really make me think that that there's a place for new mythos novels. Um, there hadn't been one for a long time up until then. There, you know, they, they were few and far between. But, you know, Joe really just knocked it out of the park with Nightmare's Disciple. Um, that said, you know, Joe and I were really great friends. And we would talk about lots of things. And we would sit around the table, you know, whether it be in Providence or in um, the Columbia River Brewing Company in Portland. Mm -hmm. And I would drink and he would smoke and we would talk. And we would talk about projects and we would talk about projects that were never going to happen. Like we had this dream project of a... Um, Dr. Fives anthology oh. mm -hmm. that we knew wasn't never going to happen. You know, the literary rights. Yeah. And right. the, guy, the guy who wrote still alive. So he, he wrote another book. So he's not giving it up anytime soon. He, he wrote, <laughs> he wrote Dr. Fives books that almost read like they're written by Joel Fowler. Yeah. Um, and in i'm gonna i'm gonna say this and it's gonna come out wrong but joe and i did not get along literally when it comes to our styles they are horribly and incompatibly different mm -hmm. and i knew it and he knew it and we would butt heads over it. and joe at times was very very upset with me because he he's he would see something I wrote. He would read it and say, "You wrote this over a weekend," and I'm like, "Yeah." They could, came to me on Friday. They said they needed something Monday. I wrote it three days. Come on, what do you want? And he's like, "Yeah, you don't don't do that." And I'm like, 
it, it still pays the same. <laughs> I'm still getting five cents a word. <laughs> um, and but you know he's like, you would point to other things that I'd done and like for the, the the very long and what I think of as my my incoherent piece that I wrote for um, Unlanguage, Joe absolutely loved. And nobody else who ever read it could understand it. But Joe got it. And eventually, it did eventually get published. And, it, you know, but I had to rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. And Joe would have said, that's okay. That's the process. And that's not, you know, something we always agreed on. You I and, and Joe and I had a long conversation about this. I think that the, you know the word processor and word software has probably been the worst thing that could happen to writers ever because it gave editors the opportunity to force writers to write and rewrite and rewrite and rewrite ad infinitum. You know, Back in the day, you got one set of comments, you addressed them, and you sent them in. Now, there's no reason why you can't, you know, edit for one or two years. I can see Cisco nodding there. You Luddite. And it's, it's not that I'm a Luddite. It's just that you, <laughs> I get it. You know, it's, 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 a, it's the ability to do, rewrite and make things perfect. But... It, it shouldn't take five or six iterations and comments from an editor on the same thing. And I've actually, I've actually called editors out on, you know, this, this edit that we're going through the fifth time, that's an edit of what you told me to write. That, that's an edit of your edit. So let's get, but my point is that Joe saw rewriting as part of the process. I see it as a partial part of the process that has to come to an end sometime. And I, there are other writers. Willem was one of them. Harlan Ellison was one of them who would take stories and, and publish them and then come back to them and rewrite them decades later. And not just style, whole plots. Whole plots, yes. They, and it's like... Oh my God. And this is create for collectors. This just creates nightmare stuff. But, but Joe and I had very different styles. We had different goals in our writing and we talked about it. And it's, you know, I, we talked about these in the Necronomicon and what he was trying to do with that. And it's just like, I, I just couldn't see how I, I, I wrote two or three stories for that book. And I just could not capture the drift of what he wanted he wanted more mood than story in my opinion and that's okay yeah. but as, as he would constantly berate berate me with it's like pete you want to tell a story all the time you want to tell a story and you're a, you're a natural born storyteller and that's not always what i want and you know, we just could not get along that way that said, I got two stories out of him. I got, <laughs> I got to publish um, when I did uh, Legacy of the Reanimator. I got the reprint uh, Herbert West Reanimated, which included great work from not only Joe but a bunch of other people. And then I got him to write a story for the Chromatic Court, which I had to pull him along kicking and screaming because it's exactly what he didn't want to do. I wanted a Lovecrafting King and Yellow story from Joe Pulver. And I got one. And, you know, but he didn't like it. But ultimately, you know, Joe and I had this sort of frustrating relationship. We were really great friends. And we agreed on a whole slew of things. But when it came to writing, we were just at cross paths with each other. But and that's we, okay. And we were perfect and we were perfectly okay with that. 
Yeah, because it's, it's not being crossed paths. It's mutual respect. He loved your work. He, there were times where, ah, I don't remember, there's a writer that used to do night shifts in a hotel and would actually make additional... Brian things. McNaughton. Right, thank you, by uh, writing not exactly horror stories. And Good point. Part, mm -hmm, and part of him... When Warren paid the him, bills for him for a while. And that was the thing. A, a small part of that was jealousy, the kindness, when, you know, the month comes to an end and we're discussing what are we going to buy? Are we buying food? Are we buying toilet paper or cigarettes? Because sometimes it was just like that. And he would say, I love, I'd be one of these people that could bang out things like Rolex over the weekend and just fucking sell it to get money, um, which he couldn't. He, he couldn't help himself. He would literally, and I'm not overdoing this, he would spend weeks arranging three words in a sentence. Right. He, he was like that. He couldn't help himself. There's, I have some things that are labeled drafts that are perfectly done. They need housekeeping. That's all they need. And he was jealous, absolutely, about people that could just do that because he couldn't. And he loved you to pieces. And I, I loved him to pieces. And, you know, it's just, it, it, it was, you know, we, 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 and we talked about this a lot. You know, that, that we just could not come up with projects that we both thought we could work on together. That's not true. Well, well. It's called the Lovecraft Easy. Look at one of the first. No, 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 no. Look at the first, no, one of the first few issues. Yeah. Doesn't that one of them have a big fishy menu, which is a revenge story on you? How much closer do you want to work with? Oh, something? yeah. Go to, okay, folks uh, listening, go to lovecraftusing.com and the, there's a search bar in the, somewhere around the top right and type in a big fishy menu. And it's basically, if I remember, Pulver getting some sort of revenge on, on Rollick. And it features also a really, really great illustration by Nick Gucker, if I'm not mistaken. So. It's, and it's free. To, it's free to read. So it's sort of like as God and Satan decided to screw Job, the King in Yellow and Nyloth attempt to decide to screw uh, Pete Rollick. Yeah. And I wasn't going to tell you this, Pete, but I, I do have a big fishy menu in transcript with notes from Joe. So you know, I have right. to for Joe. <laughs> so. Um, ah. I, I, I did I miss anyone? I don't think I did, except for Cat, yeah. of course. Um, I want to say just a couple things quickly, Mike, and then Mike. Oh, I'm sorry, Matt Carpenter. I want to say something too. And what, Pete? No, you forgot Matt. Yes, thank you, Matt Carpenter. No worries, Matt Carpenter. Uh, okay, I just have a few very brief things I wanted to share. It's like I never worked professionally with Joe, like the writers here, but. If you say when you first met Joe, it was this chapbook, this Rainfall Books chapbook, uh, for which I will be grateful for Steve Lines, who recently died also. Can you read the title for him? It's it for night, those who are listening later. The Night Music of Oak Dean. It's Rainfall Publication 011. They got up to about 350 before Steve died, something like that. I think this came out before 2009 or about then. I don't remember uh, exactly. That, that story was your introduction to Joe? Yeah, it was like, I, it, because there are three of his stories in it. And this one was dedicated to Brian Lumley, The Night Music of Oak Dean. And the first paragraph, well, I just want to read the first sentence. They say Day and his penetrating herald, Dawn, have restorative powers, but night, mute, a noble night, has her chanson. And the paragraph goes on, and at that point, it's like, <laughs> okay, I, I am so in, you know, yeah. what else have you written? Yeah. And it was you know, a while I, before he got 
uh, his first collection published, which was may have been a few years later. I don't remember the timing exactly, but this is uh, when I read that story, I knew this guy's brilliant. And uh, I really want to read more of what he writes. It's, so for this, I am grateful to not only Joe, but Rainfall Books. Um, uh, I, there's one thing that happened once also, um, I ended up editing two books for Sam Gafford uh, that I put out for submissions, like all the, it was all competitive submissions. And I, because I thought this was going to be a Lovecraft pastiche kind of book, I, I was afraid to approach people that I vaguely knew. This was by 2015. You're talking about a lonely and curious country? Yeah, and so, but afterwards, Joe told me he was in the nicest way, <laughs> the nicest way. He was a little bit affronted, disappointed. I don't know the word that I hadn't asked him to submit a story. And I thought, I'm a fucking idiot. Because I thought this was too small a book for someone with a massive reputation like Joe Pulver. I was too diffident to approach him. I mean, I got some, like, Pete's in the book, but he submitted a story. I didn't request it of him. And I just felt I could have had a Joe Pulver story if I had Matt, um... enough to ask. You just brought back a memory for me. My very first contact with Joe, besides reading Nightmare's Disciple uh, before I ever made his acquaintance, um, I, I started being more aware of him as, as the magazine started in 2011. And I've always been the kind of person that, I'm, I'm not pushy in the slightest, but I, I always think that if you don't ask, the answer is always no. So I sent Joe an email and I said, I realized that, you know, you're, I think I said something along the lines of, this is probably beneath you. You got bigger projects to worry about, but if you ever wanted to send me something, you know, I would, I would sure love to publish it. I, I don't know. I think 30 minutes went by and there were a lot of exclamation points in the email and he was very happy to send me something. And I just thought, you know, it, it it was so great, and from the from from there on, we became friends, which I've talked about. When I think of Joe, I, I think about, of course, all the Lovecraft Easing video podcasts and podcasts. I think about, um, I think about being at conventions and seeing him outside the Biltmore or another building that convention goers were going in and out of, and it was his favorite place to be. His favorite part of conventions was standing outside of a place like the Biltmore, smoking a cigarette and talking to everybody that went by. You're smiling really big, Jeff. Yeah, was <laughs> I mean, his, office. Think, his office was the sidewalk. <laughs> that, 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 that's right. And he always had a crowd because his passion and his excitement was so contagious, you know? Um, and I would never join the crowd. I would always kind of watch from a distance and feel so happy for him, you know, that he was there. Um, the, uh, another couple of things that I want to say is that um, I, there's this uh, series I really like that I've mentioned on the show before, Angel. And in the first season, Angel loses a friend. So he goes to these godlike beings called the Oracles, and he asks them, uh, he, Angel loses his friend because his friend saves a bunch of people and sacrifices his life. So Angel goes to the Oracles and asks them, and he said, you've been back time before, bring Doyle back, you know, I need him. And <clears throat> the Oracles are, are like, don't, don't talk to us about, um, you know, such trifling matters. And uh, 
Angel says, he's my friend. And they, they said something that's always stuck with me. If that is so, then it will always be, you know, and that, you know, the meaning was that his death does not change the fact that you're his friend. I also thought about, for you Star Trek nerds out there who've read a lot of the novels, one of the best ones is, is called Time for Yesterday. Very long story short, Spock has a son and his son lives 5,000 years in the past on another planet, not Earth. And he felt he needed to go there to preserve the timeline, you know, to stay there, I mean. Um, and Spock is kind of, does he think of, because he can go to the Guardian of Forever and probably go see him, maybe. Uh, and the Guardian's acting up. So Spock can't decide whether to think of his son as being dead for 5,000 years or alive somewhere on the other side of time. And he's talking to this, this alien about this. And she says to him, in the immensity of the all, you are forever his father. And I feel that way about Joe, that in the immensity of all in time, of time and space, Carl Sagan said something similar. He's my friend. He's our friend. And he always will be our friend. Um, Mike Griffin did a really, really great thing several years ago in 2016. Is that right, Griffin? Yeah. Um, I mean, you do Sounds great right. things every day. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the Pulver Day. Yeah. So th there was there were there were a lot of great entries. There were some funny entries. There was some there was a lot of entries. And uh, my entry uh, and thanks for inviting me. The first few paragraphs were uh tongue in cheek you know i i, I didn't know yet I, I didn't know joe was going to be dead in four years it just never crossed my mind you know and i think that more of us need to eulogize writers and creative people that we uh really appreciate before they die and not just after you know we're utilizing you utilizing Joe now, but we we did we did this for him before he died too, and, and that's because of Mike Griffin. Here's what I wrote. Um, he's gone now, and I got a couple of emails. Oh my God, is Joe dead? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm writing this as if he's gone. So I wrote, he's gone now, but we still have his work. He lives on through his books, and he continues to inspire this is what we've been talking about. He continues to inspire this new generation of weird fiction writers. I know because I've heard them talk about them. And lately I've heard something else. One last tale, you might say. Uh, they say that sometimes, long after midnight, when the writing block sets in and everything feels hopeless, when they feel that perhaps they aren't cut out to be writers or creators, when a gibbous moon hangs in the sky and the stars almost look black, something strange happens. Their computer monitor flickers and then a window opens on the corner of the screen. At first, all is dark. Then a match flares and a man with a white beard and a drooping mustache lights a cigarette. He's sitting at a desk bookshelves tower over him. He glares and they can feel his eyes boring into them through cables and Wi-Fi and time and space from Carcosa. And then he speaks. Bleed, he says to him. Bleed on the page. So, um, I know, Kat, you're always waiting for that window, but uh, I hope that I Just, you know, I love Joe and I always will. I, I know the rest of you feel the same way. And, and that's, I think that's all I have to say, except when you talk, Cap, mm -hmm. maybe 
you just briefly mentioned twin sons, you know. So the floor is, is yours, Ms. Bulver. <laughs> You want me to talk now? <laughs> I know. I, I made you. I made you cry. I'm sorry. Oh, so I, can I read one more thing from that page? I, I'm. I'm so sorry. My brain is. Sure. Go on. You've already wasted me. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, you're gonna pay for this. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Then I continue. If you've read this far, by the way, you can read this whole thing uh, on the Lovecraft Easing website. Again, in the search bar, just type in. Pulver and goodbye, maybe, and you'll come to it. I, I write, if you've read this far, this is a year ago, then I'm going to leave you with a couple of quotes from one of my favorite films, Arrival. For whatever reason, I find them comforting when thinking of Joe. Uh, and the quotes are, but now I'm not so sure that I believe in beginnings and endings. There are days that define your story beyond your life. Despite knowing the journey and where it leads, uh, I embrace it and I welcome every moment of it. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Until you try back in again. Uh -huh. oh. All right. Uh... Where do I start? Where do I finish? I should you probably... Huh? You made Cat cry. Yeah. Fucker knows exactly how much that story means to me. I made myself craft too. <laughs> uh, yes, I used the bad word. That's what you get out of me when you do this to me. Um, for the record, <laughs> that was one of the first things that actually came to mind when Joe had passed. And... Um, for some reason that had always stuck with me. I don't know why, but be that as it may. Um, the first warning, the one warning I have to give out to all the ladies, do not do online dating. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. Uh, Joe and I, like Lena and Mike, cross paths on MySpace for the first time. So that's actually how this whole crazy thing um, happened and this is why I was laughing all the time when all of you talked about meeting her in the flesh for the first time because yeah it's like welcome to the airport by the way this is what you imported from the states see if you can live with it um, because we hadn't met in person before he actually moved here um, it's been a fun ride um, I there's been hard times there's been hellish times and I've talked to some to you in private about the horrors that were the last couple of months um, it's been worth it it's <sighs> looking back at things I <sighs> I'm angry about the cyst having happened and all the crap that came after it um do I regret any of these days? No. It's been fun. It's been cool. And just seeing him wake up in 2010 when he came here through the easy shed, through meeting all of you guys and dozens of other people, being able to, yes, talk about the work, but yes, also talk about movies. How many times? You got to remember the time difference here. So this starts at midnight and I would usually be working Sundays and sometimes I'd call in a couple of minutes before uh, the chat started saying I was leaving work or I was about to arrive and whatnot. The times I would wake up by 4 or 5 a.m. and he would still be talking to someone, just having a ball, just having fun. Uh, he hated typing. He really, really hated it. Stories or not. So the invite to talk via Skype or Google Hangouts or whatever was always his go-to weapon. And you should have known what you were getting into. I tried to talk him into learning to type and he would always shut me down very quickly. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, 
that was as much as he hated technology uh that was something he loved um so i can just say i'm thankful that he got introduced to technology to the easing to all of these amazing people out there to folks he agreed and disagreed with um all of you who talked to him on for more than five minutes you know how much he loved discussing things not arguing but looking at left and right and what was bad and no matter if it was movies or music or literature and you, you filled his life to a point that most of you probably don't understand is he was living on an island in a different country across the ocean you were his people to talk to and you know just living with someone doesn't make up for all the interchange with the crazy people so that being said thank you for talking to him no matter if you're someone who's listening or if you're someone who is on the chat and before we all start pulling out tissues um announcements here's the fun part um i have several things in the fire right now tons of irons to be exact they still need to be approached but yes i'm looking at someone for someone to put out the orphan palace again i'm just waiting for the cheers to be finished out there okay um there will be several new publications one of them being an unpublished king and yellow story we are, oh, um, nice. yeah we are um under twin sons edited by james chambers who will cross paths here shortly i think yeah um yeah well uh, august 1st he'll be on the show to talk about this mm -hmm. um he and derek hussey more or less bullied me into finding something they could publish no they were amazing you know i did a langan i overstepped the uh, deadline i overstepped the word count and they were still happy to accept it um i'm putting together several collections one of them a pure poetry collection if i ever find someone interested in publishing something that's not going to make any money back um there'll be a lot of new pulver i just have to find the time and strength to finish up with this because it's no fun between reading this and hearing his voice in my head and uh fighting my eyesight so it's going to take time but things will come and i now give the floor back to everyone else because i have no clue what to talk about give me a question well, or leave me be. Uh, i think we're about ready to finish up but i will say and anyone else please any last comments you have i will say this about about you cat that um i told you this in private the other day that you've been pretty hard on yourself it is amazing how much you have accomplished in the last year since joe passed you know with his work with with everything that you're doing with his work and to add on to that health problems and really bad eyesight i i don't know anyone who would have done as well i know i wouldn't have you know so you you're you know you're uh you're doing joe proud if he's looking for from carcosa he's got to be pretty happy with you so jeff i can see you want to say something me yes you i'm just absorbing no i'm just it's, it's too much there's there's no way to express all that could be said it's just like when you have these when i would have these long talks with joe joe you could just go on forever you, there is no end to it it's true there is no end to talking about it. it's true i could could add one thing because I, I i knew Please. joe before he met cat and uh cat you you changed his life i mean uh you you pulled him out of a place that was not very good for him as i'm sure you knew and uh there's no doubt that you made his life inestimably better uh, uh he was a different person after he got to know you 
and after he, he moved to Germany and he was with you, um, <clears throat> there was something soul killing about his previous circumstances, something that was really grinding him down and getting with, and he liberated himself from that. Uh, but that was big. I think you were the catalyst, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> for that. Uh, you really got him out of, uh, you, you really saved him in a, in a way, or, you know, helped him save himself. We could say you know, being generous and, um, yeah, it was a good thing. It was a very good thing that he met you. Thank you. I, as much as I like beating myself down because I feel I'm not doing things fast enough and good enough, I know that this is one of the things I'm so utterly, I don't know if I can say proud of, but excruciated, excruciatingly happy to just having been able to open the door and kick him through and say, go. Go, go, go. Don't even come back. And boy, did he. Due to all of your support, due to all of the love. And uh, yes, I do have the image of a Michael Sisko in color. And uh, I love it. And yes, it is uh, Matt... Uh, Pete, this is from 99, so no worries about having met or not met someone. I'm sure you wouldn't even have recognized the old man. <laughs> and uh, who, who mentioned Night Music of Oak Dean? Matt. Matt, okay. Uh, this story gets creepier. There is um, part of it where the um, where chants are being played to call something. If you remember that vaguely. There is a reading of that thing. Really? Uh-huh. By someone who's in the chat. <laughs> Michael. Uh-huh. And I don't know how he does that. And it's it's how I got introduced to Cisco, just for the record. Um, I was told that he was handed a sheet of paper with the incantations. And he looked at it and started reading it like he spoke the damn language. <laughs> Go to YouTube, look for, I think it's with Rainfall or with Steve Lyons. Just look for Michael Sisko and Night Music of Oak Dean and blast your brains out. Well, from the CD, uh, Strange Eons, in w on which um, Joe read a, a cut himself. A track yeah. on it. That, that's one of my prized possessions. Yeah, mm. I believe Bob Price read something there too. And I think it was something that Joe wrote. And it was... Um, yeah. We all recorded that in Joe's office in his old place up in New, upstate New York, an office that rivaled Bob's in the sheer density of action figures. It was probably a one to one relationship between action figures and books. Uh, but we all, you know, it's like Joe just set up a mic and said, we're reading this and here's your part and here's your part. And, you know, that was Joe. And he, he did it before you knew what you were doing. <laughs> you know, yeah, um, I, always I, I, I suspected. But did not know, um, Cisco, what you just said about it. But, well, let's put it like put it like it is. You got a cat saving him from a situation, and we all need someone. You know, creative types. They, we all need someone behind us. You know, I mean, doesn't not even necessarily creative types, but um, you know, I think of uh, whether you like. Dean Koontz is ready or not. You know, he tells this story about his wife says, um, I will work for five years and I will pay all the bills, will do everything. And you write, you write every day. You write like it's a job. You write eight to 10 hours a day. And if you haven't made it after five years, you're not going to make it, you know, and you just can't dismiss those people behind that. that make it possible for that creative person to succeed and and don't misunderstand me it's it's sometimes it's the the the, the male in the relationship doing it for the female you know it's just it, it's not gender based um it's it's and, a passion it's the passion yeah, it, it's passion for what they're doing yeah if you have a partner and it doesn't matter if it's writing if it's music uh if it's 
I, I don't know, rescuing animals for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. If someone has a passion and you can tell how important it is for, for them, try and give them the space. You don't have to be an idiot like me working 40 hours a day so your husband can sit in his chair and bleed all the way the pages. Uh, but just just try it. It's uh, As long as someone can somehow provide. I mean, we had tight months. Jesus. Uh, but try. Don't look at the money. Try and see if you can get somewhere. We had no, a tenure. Uh we had a 10 year deadline because we were lucky enough to be able to say that at some point he would get social security and we would somehow manage to knuckle through a decade of you know pasta for two weeks when money was tight um he of course clocked out on me months before his retirement but you know that's that's how things go and that's the other lesson we're all too familiar with you never know when it's gonna be over yeah there can be an accident, there can, whatever can, can happen. Yes, we had an age difference. Yes, I didn't expect to grow 80 with him by my side. I didn't expect him to leave this early. And you have plans, but you never know what happens. So the one thing I can say, I have no regrets about doing this and the hard times, the good, the bad, the horrors, the growly beast on an airplane. Holy crap. <laughs> oh, trying to, to keep him from killing people because my luggage had gotten lost. It did return a day later. Um, but I said, just, just go for it. When you can go for it, don't, don't sit there when you're 80 and you're slowly dying and you're thinking of all the things you could have done and should have done try it if you fail you fail it happens. Um, if you remember guys a month or two back we interviewed Salem Baxter who uh, appeared on Doctor Who recently I really like her she, she's Scottish really great lady and uh, one of the things she said really stuck with me she said if you if you want to live your dreams you know you're a creative person you really want to live your dreams or whatever those dreams are it's not that you'll necessarily always be poor, but you have to be willing to be poor. And, that, and that's really stuck with me, the, the, the willingness to put the dream above the money. Because, and I often say this, I don't want deathbed me looking back on me right now going, you're a fucking idiot. You know, you, you, know you, you should have taken the chance. You should have taken the rest. You know, so, and you help Joe take that risk, is my point, uh, Kat. Uh, a couple of comments from the sidelines. Carol says, thank you for sharing your words and your thoughts, everyone. Uh, Kim Smelter says, ah, oh, damn it, I made it this far without crying. <laughs> Welcome to my life, Kim. Hello. <laughs> and speaking of wonderful, wonderful support people. Uh, Danielle Davis, who's at school watching this while she gets ready for her work week, says, uh, cat is wonderful in caps. So, so yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Right back at you. Well, uh, I think that's you all heard. we've got, unless anyone wants to say anything else in closing. I was just going to add one briefly, kind of following briefly. what we were just talking about. And Joe, when Joe was in Portland, Mike, I think it was when you were here, and I think you were taking a nap and didn't feel well, and we went on a drive, and we kind of just... Yeah, drove. out of migraine, yeah. Yeah, we drove, we just spent two or three hours driving around, and me showing him things around Portland, and we just talked. We we weren't going anywhere, we just killed time, basically. And for quite a while, what we talked about was that he, was what his life had been like, because this is something that I hadn't known until this conversation, what his life had been like before Germany, you know? I knew some things like I knew about, oh, I used to go hang out at Bob Price's house or this is how I started publishing this book. But I didn't know about his personal life before that. And soul crushing Walmart experiences. Yeah. And he talked about, you know, he said from certain people's point of view, the life that I had before I came to Germany might have seemed like a decent life. You know, got a decent car, a decent house, you got a family, um, you know, the outward appearance of sort of some comfort level and some success and whatever. But he said... You know, it was, it was 
not giving me any pleasure. It was not giving me any sense of living my life for a reason. And he said, when I had the opportunity to change it, uh, it just seems like such a, a necessary thing to do. And he said, now some people might look at how I'm lived now and compare it to how I was living before and say, why did you change that? You were comfortable and it was easy and you had, you know, like I said, a big house and whatever. And now you're trying to scrape by and trying to get paid a few bucks for selling a story. But he said, uh, for what really matters, um, he was he was getting he was getting what life was all about there um, after the change that he made, and that Cat was a big part of making his life worth something and making his life uh, before it was too late, uh, getting something out of it and getting to try to be the the Joe Pulver that we all kind of know and love, and you know really living in the words and the songs and the the poetry, really being in it all the time, um, kind of swimming in it. That, that that was that that he felt like there was no question in his mind that he had made the right decision and it didn't matter if there were times when money was tight or when he wanted to go do something and they couldn't afford to do it it was not didn't matter you know that he felt I'm like so for sure it had worked out the way he wanted it to mike i'm so glad that you shared that because that's that's exactly what i'm talking about and yeah joe felt that way from uh, external appearances people might say wow you really took a, a dive downhill but not in his mind no he wanted to do what was important and i think that anyone listening out there it doesn't matter what you do if your passion is to rescue puppies if your passion is to write sculpt teach whatever it is you know go for that don't sell out it's easy to sell out you know yeah he definitely did not regret making the change not in, not that i ever heard and said that he felt very much the opposite way um all right a couple of last ones christina mole says uh oh well my wife says in honor of joe i am she knew this was going to be hard on me as i'm sure it was hard on all of you in honor of joe i'm going to cook steaks for the boys good night to everyone got to get to the store love to all christina mole says fuck i really felt that thank you guys i think she's talking about what you said mike uh or maybe the whole thing i don't know and kevin wilson uh long 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 time le a listener of the show and supporter says a wonderful tribute from all of all of you and last but not least kelly young really wanted to be here he was coming in from out of town uh and he sent me a message a little bit ago and says dang it i'm stuck in sunday traffic please give my love to everyone there so uh we all know how Kelly felt about Joe too. So I, I really appreciate all of you coming on today and talking about our friend. So, uh, uh, final, final words on my end. Yes. Kelly has been stuck in traffic for a reason. Yeah, this, he doesn't know how to drive. Yeah, other than that, we, we all know that this would have brought up memories of someone else and it's enough that you made some one person cry in public. We don't need Kelly to, you know, go off the deep end tonight. It's well. Uh, I know he's here in spirit, and that's all that counts. He Kelly's is a very private person, but as he said, twenty twenty took so much from all of us, and we'll right. we'll, we'll we'll leave it at that. Took there'll so much be, from all of us. There'll be a time when we all cross paths again, and. You'll yeah. all pay for this. Maybe not Kelly. Maybe he will. We'll see. But yeah, yeah thank you for giving us all this venue, Mike. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, thanks to everybody for being here. Uh, if it was just me and me reminiscing, it would uh, not be very powerful, but all of us together talking about Joe. And I do want to say I invited other people for various reasons that, uh, that were close to Derek Joe and for various reasons they couldn't make it. Um, and so, uh, you know, you guys are in our thoughts too. So anyway, um, thanks everyone. And we've got uh, Bo Johnson as, as the guest next week. Thank you so much to all my patrons uh, for keeping the lights on because literally that's what you do. Um, and uh, if you're not a patron, you get a lot of extra stuff, a lot of extra podcasts, just Google Lovecraft Easy and Patreon. And, and again, thanks to you guys for being here and 
we will see everybody next week.